Good evening and welcome to the first event of New Mexico Listens. We're present here tonight on Tewa land. We acknowledge the ancestors, past, present, and future, and we have gratitude. As I said, this is the first event for New Mexico Listens. New Mexico Listens is a joint project sponsored by the New Mexico Humanities Council and implemented directly by three local League of Women Voters leagues, Southern New Mexico, Central New Mexico, and Santa Fe County. This evening's event is a special event from Santa Fe County. Our goal with New Mexico Listens over the next year is to foster civil conversation, active listening, and respectful interaction. It's a big goal and we'll be working on it right through September of 2022. After this, our first event in the month of February, we'll be offering a panel of storytellers. At the heart of our effort to promote civil conversation is an emphasis, emphasis on narrative. I'm very pleased this evening to have Christina Flanagan, a member of the League of Women Voters, Santa Fe County, to introduce our guest speaker. Christina. Thank you, Irene. And it's such an honor to be here. Um, I, I am just so touched to be uh, here bringing Dr. Esteban Rael Galvez uh, to the time with us tonight. Esteban is the former senior vice president of historic sites at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He also served as the executive director of the National Hispanic Cultural Center, the state historian of New Mexico, and is currently the CEO and founding principal of Creative Strategies 360 Degrees. He received his BA at the University of California and his MA and PhD at the University of New Mexico. An heir to these complex legacies, a native son of New Mexico with ancestral and living ties both to Native American and Hispano Chicano communities. He is in the process of completing his book focused on American Indian slavery and legacy. That's the official introduction, but I want to tell you how I met Dr. Esteban Rael Galvez. I was new to town about five, six years ago. And I was at a cocktail party. And I'm not much at cocktail parties. And it was a big one at a very nice home. And there was all this talking and going on. And I got my food and my drink. And I walked around the room to try to find someone to talk to. Didn't know a soul. And my, my feet took me to this uh, really pretty little garden place inside this home, in her inner garden. And uh, I sat down and I looked up. And here was this fella uh, looking at me with the smilingest face saying, hello, I'm Esteban. And I said, hello, I'm Christina. And he said, tell me about yourself. And I will never forget that evening uh, of welcome and true interest. There was something about who Dr. Esteban Real Galvez is that that has a like a heart tractor that, that brings you in. And um, so I'm just so pleased that my dear friend is here tonight to speak with us. And uh, when he's after his presentation, we might have a little conversation and of course, welcome your questions. Esteban, please. Thank you so much, Christina. Bupu Wale. <laughs> when I start this, good evening. Thank you for inviting me to join you today to be part of this initiative, creating a more perfect union. I thought of a presidential candidate 
who last spoke about um, creating a more perfect union. I think it was 2008, that point. Um, and then proceeded to actually live into that, inviting us into a conversation about a document that wasn't the end, but the beginning of a process. I've thought about that a lot since then, since we know that the Declaration of Independence is actually one of the things that's buried beneath the present monument on the plaza. Um, I wrote about that in a post in August of not last year, when we at some point. And, and so I didn't even know about that until I started reading the newspaper accounts thought about that even with this talk. And I was honored to have been invited by my dear friend to remind me also of that moment when we sat down. I don't think I knew anyone either. I mean, we just sat there. We were like two just little lights finding one another and trying to learn about one another at that point. I'm going to spend a lot of some time talking tonight, but it reminds me that my grandmother always told me that the best storytellers are those who learn how to listen first. And that's to me what storytelling is all about. So I love that this is called New Mexico Listens. I love that um, Christina evoked that memory of when we first met, which was really all about leaning in and listening. My intention is to really speak for about 20 or so minutes, and then we can have a conversation, hopefully. But before I jump in, let me do what I've learned early in life to do, acknowledging the ground upon which we stand. Here in this ancient and sovereign landscape, as Pueblo elders have long taught us, wherever we go, we leave our breath behind us. An invocation recognizing those that, have, those that came before us and how their life force remains surrounding us long after they have gone. I love evoking breath, particularly now. I, I evoked that thing learned as a child from my Pueblo elders for decades, but somehow the meaning of it became more and more important over the, the years to me. Certainly recognizing um, the breath that, that all those that precede us leave behind us but also an invitation for us in the breath that we leave behind, the work that we do, even the words that we say and why that matters, that it's breath. Um, but I, during uh, also a pandemic, breathing for so many people who have lost their ability to breathe and have struggled and so many have passed globally, it, breathing is also important. I've also thought about breathing in the context of, the, of, of a reckoning, a reckoning that has actually been taking place for a long, long time, but certainly has come to the surface more recently, particularly for marginalized communities who have struggled literally to breathe. And so I think of all those people as we bring their breath into this room. But we are also even acknowledging the, the land upon which we stand. It's important to recognize that we are not static museum pieces. Equally important is to recognize that in New Mexico, we are a community whose identity, whose place here is intricately layered by the convergence of people, the convergence of places. And today, we touch this ground and acknowledge the layers of that, that sovereignty, the breath of our ancestors. Like all good New Mexicans, maybe like all good humans, I don't know fully, but I, I was taught at a very early age how important it is to always introduce yourself. Not in that official biographical way, but, you know, it, it, the, the way that becomes personal, what, what makes us who we are. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I will say that I have the, I've had the privilege of study and serving in many capacities. But my core comes from being raised by values that have shaped my hunger for memory and my thirst for justice by a teacher 
an elementary school teacher, a woman who taught me how to use words as a way out, as a way back in, I'm sorry, as a way back in, knowing that I would always have to be grounded here. I was also raised by a farmer who knew that I was not gonna be a farmer and wanted me to use words as a way out. And my, my abu, my grandmother, the woman whose wisdom always encouraged me to draw deeper, still from the wells of memory, especially the broken histories, the ones that were not told, mine and those that I would encounter along the way, and to take those stories, center them, and to raise them up. Said in this context, I often say that at least three threads have defined my work for a long time. Raising consciousness, my first C, illuminating and inspiring creativity and fostering a sense of community. This is what brings me to share some thoughts today about the place that we now call New Mexico and what it tells. New Mexico, New Mexico's story is one of astonishing complexity resplendent with a tenacity of spirit. It is set in the magnificent and sovereign landscape that is both ancient and modern. Its people are the heirs to unique, richly woven histories, traditions, and a depth of memories, all manifest on the social, physical landscape, tangible and intangible, beautiful and tragic, passed from one generation to the next. There are so many ways to enter into a story, but as a way to frame my talk with you today, let me in introduce the following framework. One I created many years ago, but has stayed with me for the longest time. It, the New Mexico Digital History Project framed along the trajectory of time, people, place, and story. Let me begin with time. Next slide. If I could, next slide. So temporally, New Mexico has often been divided by archaeologists into the troublesome binary of prehistoric and historic, framed by historians into distinct time periods, pre-contact, Spanish colonial, Mexican territorial, American. All of those categories, for me, fail to capture the complexity and cycles and the transition that led up to and follow events, both the cataclysmic and the ordinary. Time here, perhaps anywhere, cannot be captured in a straight line. There it is. But rather in the symbol of a spiral and the radiating circles of cause and effect. Sometimes words, phrases, or entire stories actually reveal the dates like emergence, hot scene, the Diné word for a period remembered as watching for enemies. Yet among the countless dates, there are many that hold meaning still, contact and settlement. For instance, 1539, the present, the moment for the first contact at Hialona, Iwana, the middle place, present day Zuni Pueblo. 1598, the date of Spanish settlers arrived in New Mexico. Revolutions, including that of 1680, the most successful indigenous uprising in what is now the US, one that would ensure survival and rescript Pueblo Spanish relations. So that all of us that descend from that are marked by those moments or that of 1847, defined by a coalition, a coalition, a coming together of Pueblo and Hispanos who would rise up against US imperial forces and the occupation, one that came about because of the imperial notion of manifest destiny. The moment, the, the moment I don't want to forget, it was a coalition. It wasn't the first time that that coalition would take place, and it wouldn't be the last. Belonging, 1912, the date that New Mexico shifted, shifted finally from the territory to a state, following six decades, six decades of denial of full citizenship to its residents, primarily because of race and religion. 
congressional records detail the period uh, of the period revealed deep-seated racism, interestingly directed primarily at mixed race people. Mongrels, I think is the word that is used in the official records in Congress. They take the worst it's written, of the Indian and the Spanish, honoring neither one. In the century since this transition, a chain of events would transpire. The rise of the military industrial complex, the building of a bomb, the development of intern camps, right, an intern camp right here in Santa Fe, and the continuous struggle over civil rights. New Mexico is indeed delicate, changing, but there are always lessons and there is still joy. But it may not lie in the grand or the epic, but instead within common cycles, celebrations or ceremonies, those things that historians often don't write about, but I remember, dust rising from dances that have persisted for ages, language and prayer that rises and falls like song, fingers moving over rosary beads, the births and anniversaries that have resulted from love, the dignity of work, annual rituals of cleaning the ditch, harvesting the crop, or the daily act simply of preparing and sharing a meal. Next slide, place. The representations of New Mexico spatially are revealed primarily in cartography, the artistic practice of placemaking. Though in the colonial context, mapping is largely about power and politics. We see that taking place or about to take place right now been taking place forever. Positioning people, places, and objects in space, lines on a parchment that are often made at the behest of distant popes, kings, and presidents. Here, the manifest ideology of empire making, Spain, Mexico, and the United States, is revealed in the colonial and even modern context, where settlement occurs hand in hand with dispeopling of an area. Poblacion siempre viene con despoblacion. Tracing the lure to land reveals the contradiction of land grants, of artist colonies, and the economic push and pull of migrations, resulting in a contest over space and place that continue in the development and gentrification, rising up in neighborhoods across the state. I also think of racial covenants that dictated dictates where people could live. Many of those covenants are still in the books, including here in Santa Fe. No Asians, no Blacks allowed. But I think about how one place pushes against another. It always has. In this, I think of the Great Migration as well, how the racisms of other places continue to push people away and how those migrations would come to impact other places, like not just like places like Blackdom in our state, but Albuquerque and Las Cruces. But place the first of all beings, according to Aristotle, also reflects where wisdom comes and continues to sit, particularly salient, where the continuous human habitation on the land is thousands of years old, perhaps beyond time. Even now, when someone looks at a ruin, but sees a home full of laughter and tears, they recognize the deep connection to a geographic humanity. Ancient worldviews are reflected in indigenous homelands, though they were diminished or lost by conquest, though many were diminished or lost by conquest. I'm tracing an ancestor to a pueblo that came to be known as San Cristobal, which was as large and great as Taos and Pecos once was, but after the 18th century, no longer existed. One of hundreds of communities. Doña Inez would come to live her entire life in the 1600s in this place. And I and probably thousands and thousands of other people descend from that woman who lived here. So Tano people 
live continuously in blood memory, I think. But some of those locales and communities certainly did survive and have been re retained. The four sacred mountains that define the parameters of the Diné, Ta, Diné homeland. The Tewa Pueblo Indian world, which embodies spaces that radiates and reflects balance surrounding Bunge, heart of the Pueblo and the homes and villages, just like the nearby hills, encircle the community and far off mountains further still, connecting land and sky to people. There is also the Spanish word and concept, querencia, more than a love of land, but a generational, generational connection to the homeland for Indo-Hispanos who became land-based after 400 years people who are connected themselves to indigenous people ancestrally and in the contemporary moment as in in-laws, friends, and neighbors. Understanding why and how people settled where they did and how they designed, built, and sustained the structures they did is critical. Indeed, the human touch upon the land is visible everywhere. Central plazas, churches, villages, burial grounds, Architectural lands all serve as anchors. These lands are intricately connected by trails, roads, and acequias, ancient waterways that convey water from the field, rivers to the field. In all of these spaces, New Mexico has long been a place of convergence. Villages have sustained multiple changes, including a mixture of mud and modernism, where even mobile homes have been converted to reflect a local vernacular. People, next slide. Let me move to the frame of people. Last year, I read with great interest Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, where she compares the German Third Reich, India, and what she refers to as the US caste system. As much as I love Wilkerson's work, and I learned so much from this book, she falls into what has become an expected mode of thinking of the US, of the US as an East Coast centered and within a black and white paradigm. But the reality is that at least since 1848, New Mexico identity is set within a national paradigm of race that persistently renders non-whites, non-blacks invisible entirely. But we are layered here in this place, perhaps everywhere, not only contending with that caste system, what Wilkerson calls the US caste system, but an overarching tourist framework, as well as a much older caste system. The word caste actually comes from the Portuguese Spanish word casta. Tricultural myth is the first caste we deal with. Thanks entirely to the tourism industry, even locally representations of New Mexico's people are reduced to an early 20th century invention of three typologies, Anglo, Indian, and Spanish. We still operate in that typology. We respond to it, we think that way. Our very conceptions are based on that mythology. If you go away from nothing from this talk, Eliminate that from your thinking as much as possible. An enduring and yet deeply fought, flawed mythology. This framework that has served as a shorthand for defining pe people of New Mexico are, could not be more offensive or erroneous. It erases entire communities, including African and African-American presence that however small, existed in the colonial period and exists still in contemporary communities. Asian Americans, including Japanese that were interned in the mid 20th century. It collapses, it creates a mold of a singular American Indian identity as if being a uh, uh, Diné, a Inde, Apache or being Ute and being Okeowinga is the very same each hold distinct languages, histories, and worldviews. We would never say that French and German, ah, they're one thing. <laughs> we, we do that here all the time. It failed 
to recognize also the, the, the beauty and the complexity of mixture and difference. That thing that, that Congress wanted to completely uh, ignore in the 1850s, where even the slavery of indigenous peoples was foundational in the development of who we are still. As if the caste system that Wilkerson speaks to in the tricultural myth is not enough, the greatest antecedent to race and identity here is based on that original caste system. The, here identity is unique in the language of blood and belonging that developed within Spanish colonial rule was highly complex racial taxonomy, cultural hierarchy of caste that operated to control difference it dictated who you could marry, where you could live, what you could own. Terms that are still recognized today, mulato, but also others that reveal the absolute absurdity of the caste system. Salte atrás, fall back, tente negre, suspended in air. No te entiende, no te entiendo, I don't understand you. Most of these, that people were called this, they were labeled that. <laughs> Most of these categories, those absurd ones, they're all absurd, but those especially absurd ones were not necessarily used in New Mexico, but other parts of Mexico. The ones that were predominant, including here in Santa Fe, were colores quebraos, broken colors. That's pretty absurd, right? Colores sospechosos, suspect colors. There's probably not a single New Mexican that does not descend from suspect colors and broken colors. Seriously, it was a vocabulary so ingrained that some permea permeations continue to exist to this day, including words like mestizo and coyote. However, identity is neither static nor something that is, can easily be placed in a box. No one emerged pure, no one, no community that lives here in New Mexico or anywhere emerged pure from the impact of colonialism. Here, it is instead more like a nesting doll, one inside the other. Beauty buried in the uh, layers of complexity and consciousness. Unknown perhaps, but it's still there. Some individuals and communities stand in strength and sovereignty. Others, whether they carry the complexity of their ancestry in their faces or hands or not, sustain memory in an aching consciousness. For those that continue to live in this place, generational or recently arrived, all must recognize the astonishing complexity of this magnificent and sovereign landscape and its people. Yet the most meaningful and profound reflections of New Mexico emerge in both the individual and the collective and all of the relationships developed and sustained in between. Here can be found sketches of a multitude of experiences, including of holy men and women who have long connected ground and sky, of farmers and ranchers whose relationship to land and animals nourish community, of creatives whose hands, hearts, and minds elevate beauty and consciousness, and of leaders formal and informal, particularly those who have had the courage to rise in their hunger for justice. Next slide, story. In New Mexico, there are as many stories as there have been in, 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 as there have been people, places, and events. But recognizing the story depends on the teller and that it becomes essential. Here, multiple and overlapping themes evoke origins, prophecy, innovation, convergence. Some are tales spun to excite, enchant, or lure, and others inform and elevate. History, however, is not something that is told and represented, but it is often, more often, something that is lived, something that gives a world shape, that both engenders a contemplation of the images of the past, and that can deepen our awareness of the present. The present in New Mexico, however, retains traumas that are born from the past a spiritual, emotional, psychological wounding that radiates across generations and has contemporary implications, including internalized wounds that are only beginning to be measured. 
Yet beyond the epic and grand, including the terrible and the traumatic, there are also small everyday stories, all reflecting survival and endless dignity and strength, as well as beauty and joy. What is critical to trace, well, it is critical to trace the jagged edges of what New Mexico tells. It also is important to recognize that New Mexico's collective identity is born out of its past as much as it's nourished by it. There is a delicacy, but there is also a strength to what we do collectively to change who we are. Recovery, healing, and transcendence begins with a critical remembering. But it also frames a, a creative reimagining of the present and future. We don't have to accept that that's who we are. New Mexico's story is certainly complex and full of contradictions, but here wisdom and memories re resemble precious seeds and their germinative power uh, lies in their capacity as it always has of their heirs awakening a practice of memory that doesn't simply contemplate history, but invites us to make it. There is no way to fully measure the depths of the cultural wounding, wounding that came from colonialism and imperialism. Stata statistics are part of that measure, while statistics in part measure the impact of the devastation, particularly of poverty, homelessness, suicide, hunger, and the devastating dependence of, on drugs and alcohol, none fully capture the harm of the spirit of a community as a whole, especially when calculated across multiple generations. As I think of the, uh, the idea of cultural wounding, at a metaphorical level, the ravages of a fire that impacts a forest comes to mind. And however time there is healing that comes from the conflagration that occurs organically. The metaphor that I wanna leave you with is that of aspen trees. It's the metaphor for how we move through this, what has happened is right above us. It's all around us. In, in this way, the metaphor has become, become so deeply meaningful to my work, particularly around trauma. It, it, I think of the work of a grove of aspen trees, which offer us a way of thinking about community in three key ways, roots, resilience, and radiance. Roots provide an opening dialogue about being and belonging to a community, but also about deep connectedness. While a grove of aspens, as you all know, appears as an individual trees, it is actually one huge organism linked by a single root system. That's a lesson for us. Resilience describes the capacity I've already described it, of our community to navigate through experiences that devastate. Similarly, at first glance, aspen trees appear as picturesque, but what should not be lost is that grove's very presence reveals a forest healing following the disturbance to land. Lastly, the experience of radiance of a grove of aspen trees to hear their quaking leaves, whispering and responding to the wind, a sound like no other to absorb the magnificent light from the grove, standing resolute and alive in all seasons, nourishes the body and the soul, but also serves as a reminder of the very nature of life, beautiful and always changing. In summer, aspens capture and reflect the light only to reveal a majestic performance in the fall. Sunset colors that were there all along, hidden only to the naked eye. A process that we describe as changing. They're like us. New Mexico is more, like meta is more than metaphors, however, and more than the stories that are compounded daily by the longstanding and ongoing challenges. Emerging from these realities will not only take time and energy, but will require imagination. The people of this place hold tremendous history and wisdom, all of which reflects a transcendence that can come from the full impact of falling down and the inverse power of rising up. The velocity of this imagination defines the promise of our humanity, not just the delicacy, but the strength of, 
of what we do to collectively change who we are. Thank you so much. I'm happy to just talk now. I know, <laughs> but I, I really wanna have, I have a question for you. Um, and I know some of our folks will have questions as well. So I, but I've been sure. dying to ask you this. Sure. Thomas Friedman, in November of 2016, you remember when, what was all going on then? Yeah. Wrote a book called Thank You for Being Late. Stunning book about how he would have, uh, he, he liked being on the train and he would take the train to breakfast in DC from where he lived in Maryland. And he always went to this particular restaurant, dine or whatever, and hung out with his friends and had breakfast talked and that was that was the cornerstone of every day and he was often late or so one of them was late and they said thank you you must have been doing something important tell us about it and as he goes through this book about the changes that we were all experiencing in those times he said you know information is now ubiquitous it has no value there is more information than you could possibly deal with what is of supreme value is a good question. And, and so on, I wanna ask you, Esteban, in the important moment that we're in where identity and personal information, whether it's from 23andMe or a, a gender identity or political identity, or do you mask or don't you mask, uh, all that. When that is so top of mind, as Friedman predicted it would be, how do you find questions that engage? Ah, uh, Christina, you always ask the best questions. <laughs> <laughs> how do I find questions? I, I'm going to come back to what I said earlier that the best storytellers are those who learn how to listen. You know, I, I have the, 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 the honor um, and blessing of still having my parents at the age of 94. And they, my dad is always questioning everything. And, um, and I see me in him. Be, and I think that comes from a core value that has shaped the two of us in its curiosity, right? So it's, it's learning to like lean into those things. I listen to my parents and they're curious and they ask me those type of questions. And it's usually it boils down to what, where, why. It's this core basics. And, and I love that those interrogative questions because even a child can ask them, right? So whether it's an elder like my mom or dad um, or elders that I ha often have the, the ability to um, talk to, but it also comes from the little ones who just say, why, what, 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 <laughs> how, where? You know, it's those simple, that's those questions to me are basic. It's true that I, I also love those very complex questions that make my head swell and, and expand and contract and, and really think deeply about the world around us. And those questions, particularly about really making our way through the world. But, but, but I also love the basic ones, just that come from a child that asks how or why. Thank you for this. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Sure. And I want to invite the listeners uh, that you can also ask questions this way, I am. Uh, you can also ask questions by putting them in the uh, Q&A. Is that right, Debbie? Very good. We have a wonderful team helping us do this. Okay, so another question relative to um, the, the story that you told us this evening. You'll remember when at the opera we did Dr. Atomic. Yes. And one of the um, one of the teachings that will never leave me 
is when the US government was looking for a place to develop the bomb, they had some choices. And some person said, well, why, don't, why not New Mexico? There's nothing there. <laughs> it's such a profound statement. Uh, 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 is it Ms. Hernandez, the, the Tula Rosa downwinder? Uh, uh, forgive me. Uh, the, the, there's an organization in um, near uh, the Trinidad site that has been trying to uh, to help people get medical care, right? right. So anyway, the, no, no, nobody's there. So if that is something that somebody on the outside thought, one can only think that, so, that we on the inside think that about ourselves oh, yeah. here in New Mexico. Do you have a, a, a vision of what incremental change might look like in our relationship to the land so that we know that we're here. I almost want to just leave that there because that's so profound, everything that you just said, that was so beautifully stated. I, it, it's true that, that that's exactly what was said of this place, whether we're talking about the, those impacted where the bomb was actually set off in Southern New Mexico or in Los Alamos. And, and that's really a global phenomenon that has impacted um, communities of color, marginalized communities globally and across time to actually develop those type of sites in places, whether it's inner cities or whether it's landscapes like Los Alamos, right? That, that, that are rendered by a simple mark of a pen as um, not worthy not there, not worthy. So there's that, and, and that has happened so many places, and it's led to continuous cycles of that in those places. But it, 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 it reminds me also of, there's the downwinders down south for sure, but there's also in the Española Valley, those places and that have been deeply impacted by those traumas that I was speaking about. Um, and, and I think of the latter part of your question, which is so deeply profound and those kids that say, I'm nobody, I'm not worthy. I don't have a history. I don't come from a history. I, you know, so I'll accept what you tell me about who I am. I will put on a Spanish conquistador helmet and that frames who I am without understanding the complexity of all of that. They, they don't understand, and, and the draw to those other traumas, right, that, that yeah, I know we have them in our family, we all do, and it just, but those kids that don't think they are anybody, they're the ninguñados, the nobody of the world, and, and I, my vision for that is to continue to tell stories to say, you are somebody, pull those layers back and show them, here's what your grandfather did. Here's this incredible thing that your grandmother wove. This is who you are. This is who you come from. You come from this land, sovereign. There's you, your, your, your footprints, the footprints that were found down south, those are the footprints of an ancestor of yours. So that, and that they survived walking through that. That, that to me is what, is my vision to continue to believe in, in the power of story. To, that's my, that's my um, profession. That's how I think of the world. Other people work medically, socially, but my work is working with memory and story. So my vision is there because we don't know who we are. We have to continue to listen and tell and share those stories. Okay, so I got a follow up for sure. <laughs> Do you remember when I called you up and I said, what's this BPOC? What does that mean to you? Oh, yeah, we had a long conversation. <laughs> we said, that. I'm not so sure about it. Right. right? I'd, it, I'd also, I'd listened to something about um, Latinx versus Hispanic. And, and so 
if even the phrase marginalized troubles mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. again, it is a it is a reductionism mm -hmm. based on a dominant descriptor of someone that's not me, right? Right. right. And that's and that's kind of how I think, as we have talked about uh, BIPOC and uh, Latinx, mm -hmm. that the, the the same flavor goes through. So, as a as a person who's committed to social justice and individual story, how do you, if you had a group of high school kids? Um, here in town and and you wanted to activate the the nonviolent tension of the gadfly that Socrates talks about right. in them. How would you have them talk about themselves? How how would you how would you help them identify themselves? You know, you're a teenager, you're I mean, I remember too well. It's a long time ago, but I remember like yesterday. I mean, I, I protested the Vietnam War. I went to Columbia University and we did a silent, a, a quiet time. And I was a protester. That's what I thought of myself. I didn't think of myself as a privileged white kid. I thought of myself as a protester. And thank goodness that I was allowed to do that. How would you inspire that in, in the teenagers or the, young, or the youth that you encounter? Thank you, Christina. Mm -hmm. You can see we could have had just a wonderful conversation rather than me talking. I love these. To me, it's almost better. Um, I, I've actually done that in, in the past several years here in Santa Fe. I developed the cultural plan, um, Culture Connect Santa Fe. But even before that, we did working with one of my favorite organizations in town called Little Globe. We did City of Dreamers. And it, it, and those two projects were working together. We actually went into the high school, high schools, a couple of high schools, Santa Fe High and Capital. And we, um, I sat with high school students and we had precisely the, that conversation. Um, and, and I used to say when I was a state historian all the time, you actually, it, it, you have to start with where they're standing now, right? Those students where they're standing right now as, as history um, professionals, teachers, we wanna take them back to those moments that I was talking about, 1848, 1680, all of those moments, but they can't relate so much, right? They, but they can relate to where they're standing now about, and we had these wonderful conversations and I'm not a, a sports person, but about basketball, about like, the, the, the inner courtyards of where they were living with their grandparents. We talked about their spaces and we talked and we made them like real and legitimate. Those like legitimate sort of um, processes and spaces. And I, I was interested in, in what they had to say, what they had to tell me about those things. And so it, was, it became a reciprocal conversation about um, about just being and belonging to this place and why that mattered. I invited them to bring an object to think about what that object and what, what it meant to them in terms of their place, in terms of an ancestor, and they brought all kinds of stuff, right? And so it that's for me, it's a conversation, and and we get inspired by the story that starts to be told. And that's how I started to do that. I mean, I can think about answering that question in multitude of ways, but that's how I did it the past several years. Thanks for bringing up the cultural cartography. That was one of the first things that uh, I, I picked up from you. I thought, <laughs> oh my God, he's on the bus. He's talking to people about what it is to be a Santa Fe and that's the way to do it. The first so time I rode a bus in Santa Fe, <laughs> I loved it. So we have a question. Non, nunca? Nada? How about here? Ladies, do you have questions? Irene? I, I would like to hear more about your work in the high school plan. Something to be part of. Right. Really more. You know, I, that, was, that was the extent of my work. I mean, I, I certainly did a lot of work in, in schools at, when I was a state historian. 
Um, and then I really didn't do that much, maybe a little bit when I was at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. But when I came back and started the consulting practice and certainly the work with Culture Connect Santa Fe, I did a little bit, but that's really doesn't define a lot of the work. I let it, there are so many others in our community who are doing that much better than I am. But I can talk about other parts of my work, but that that is as much as I did there. Sure, I'm, I've um, I've sort of come back full circle to some of the work that I began with in terms of working with archives. Um, and so the Mellon Foundation has funded for the past few years and they've geared up this past year, a project that I'm the director of called, excuse me, the Manitos Community Memory Project. And it's, it's focused on the region really from, I don't know, I, I love boundaries that blur. So wherever people sort of think of themselves as the word Manito, it, let me just frame that first. The word Manito, it's another one of these labels which are all problematic, all of them, <laughs> and are all inventions, right? Because we divide ourselves up ba based on these labels. And in some cases, which, and I won't say more than this, the, the BIPOC becomes a sort of way in terms of framing um, uh, hierarchies. As much as I actually think it's important to talk about power, I'm on a tangent here, uh, as much as I think it's important to talk about power and relation and, and, and representation, there's a way in which we gravitate to some of these labels that become really problematic, I think. But I actually, we chose Manitos because the community kept telling us that they wanted to use that term, community members, I should say, certain ones, because the term was, was it, it can be traced back in some cases to the early um, 20th century. Um, and it's, a, it's short for the word hermano or hermana, which means brother and sister. And now when people see each other who are from these small villages anywhere in the world, they'll say man, mana, mano, they'll ref, it becomes a little bit of a moniker as a way, as a, as a, is a really intimate way of recognizing one another. So that's why we chose it. Some people still find it problematic, but again, those, that's what labels are. But we, the project is really intended to, um, the Mellon Foundation invited communities across the United States to actually think about what does it mean to develop a community-based archive? And, we started realizing that just working in the community, recognizing we were hearing them say, we're not reflected in the museums, we're not reflected in the, in, in the archives, in the bigger institutions, we wanna see ourselves reflected. That stuff is in museums and it is in archives, it's just hidden um, and it's not always made available. And, and so, we wanted to create a digital repository where people can start to just put up their photos, their stories, their documents, their artifacts. And that's a pro one of the projects I've been immersed in. Um, another project that, so my writing, I, I wrote my dissertation on Native American slavery. And it's both a personal and a professional project. I then became the state historian and much to the chagrin of many academics in the Ford Foundation that had funded me, I put that aside or I put it inside and it continued to grow like a tree. Um, so I, 30 years of doing research essentially on, on slavery in the region, um, all the way from the Dakotas to Mexico City. And that's, I'm, I've returned thanks to several organizations funding me, a few organizations funding me, I've returned to um, focus on the book. Um, I'm not at a point where I could just be a writer, but that's, that's 
where I wish I could focus all my effort. I would push aside all the creative strategies, all the consulting work, and I would just be writing. But that's what I'm, those two projects are predominantly what are occupying my time. I do a lot of other consulting, but those are the two. Ah, because it's, 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 um, you heard it a little bit in what I was talking about. It's who I am. I, you know, it's a story that is relatively unknown. It has shaped the very fiber of who I am. I grew up, uh, I'll share just a tidbit of an introduction that I'm writing for the book. I, I was shaped. Um, there are a lot of kids growing up in these communities who unfortunately do not know who they are, are not, do not have the privilege of having grandmothers like I had who instilled these stories, who wove them into me at a very, very young age. My grandmother, uh, my great grandmother, her name was Dulcinea, and she hated that name. I don't know why, but it's a beautiful name, Dulcinea Ariano. She, um, she was about that short. Um, she had a hump on her back. I forget what that's called, but I had the audacity as a little boy. I was like five, six, seven. I would, I would always lean, uh, go up to her and lean into her and, and touch it. All the other kids wanted to be outside playing. And I just wanted to be nestled into her. And because she always told the very same story. And I remember my dad maybe seeing me touch, touch her that way. And he said, no, don't do that. And she said, no. And I will always remember this because she kept, she, she didn't frame it for me. She said that no, he can touch it. It's a part of me. I want him to know who I am because it's a part of him. And then she would tell the same story every time of uh, one of her ancestors, La India Panana, as she referred to her, was, had been captured by another group of indigenous peoples. And they captured another man who she des described as Mexican. The woman told the man, if you take me with you, I'll show you how to escape. And they did. And I descend from that. And the Panana is a Pawnee woman. So I heard that story of this Pawnee woman, and they lived the rest of their life in Arroyo Seco, north of Taos. I heard growing up, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until I, she died when I was um, a, a teenager. Another uh, story that was told of, of um, how Nana Sela, a grandmother, a great, uh, an ancestor of mine, on my mom's side, who was a Navajo uh, woman, and it was told by an artifact. So my mom had these two wonderful blankets that, that she one, she eventually gave me both, but she gave me one when I went off. Um, to graduate school, and she said, for your protection. And that those blankets were woven by Manuelita, who was a Navajo woman who was captured and taken into Abiquiu long before George O'Keefe would, would make, bring her creativity. An ancestor of mine was weaving creativity in that same landscape. Those are the two stories that shaped me. I've since encountered many more. Third thing, when I was, I, 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 I was 10 years old when I think um, Alex Haley's Roots, the book was made into a television series and our family was glued to the TV. And I was hearing both of those stories at the same time, knowing that our story was similar. It was similar. It was not based on the transatlantic slave trade, but a different, different trajectory from different directions. And so it, it, all of that would catapult me into wanting to write an entire doctoral dissertation in it, but it's part of who I am. And it's, it, it's what I've said before that the story I think is part of the feeling. We have to, um, in Ralph Ellison's words, um, touch, the, the jagged edges, right? In order to be able to transcend, and I, that's how I think it draws me to this work. Uh, 
Are there any other questions? Um, the great Howard Thurman um, grandson. He became in love with the dark because it was in the dark that he was safe. And the stars would hang down like lanterns in the lap of the ocean and the big tree. And uh, it was his home place. And this was brought to me by a wonderful teacher named Barbara Holmes, who wrote a book called uh, Race and the Cosmos. And what these two great teachers uh, share, and I, I, I wanna close with this to bring back up the Aspen tree, is that the culture of today is, seems to, to them to be uh, idolizing light. There is a, an icon of light that we're all looking for. And of course, a tree <laughs> doesn't get very far without roots. Right. And so there's nothing wrong with reaching. But if you have nothing underground, you have nothing. And what I know of your work, what I know of you, what I know of your life, our friendship, is that you make the dark safe. You, we just heard it. And if there's anything I hope our audience takes away from this talk tonight, it's, it would be that time and place and people and story are a 24 seven thing. It's great to be out on a sunny day and it's great to walk in the dark. And, and every great story is a little scary, right? right. I love you, man. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone.